This is the moment you've all been waiting for. Live with the best father and son team on the internet. It's time for Homie and the Dude. What is up, everyone? This is Homie and the Dude, the father and son MMA and TTRPG podcast and the home of the best NPCs in all the multiverse. We are joined today by UFC featherweight Mike Grundy, who was also a Commonwealth Games bronze medalist. Mike Grundy, how the hell are you, man? I'm all good, yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on as well, lads. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the, to the show. Hey, we, we have been enjoying watching your fights and, and supporting you from afar uh, for a little bit of time. So it's actually a massive pleasure of ours to chat to you as well. Um, you, you were saying before we, we got recording that you've been coming off a, a pretty heavy surgery and, and getting back in the gym and, and kind of feeling yourself out. You also said that you're happy. Uh, would you say the gym is like your, your happy place, your, your like comfort zone, the, the place where you feel like uh, safe, secure? Like what is it about the gym that makes you so happy? Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's, it's important. It's been a part of my life since I was six years old. You know what I mean? I started wrestling when I was six. So there's never there's never not been a time where I've not trained. From six years old, I've always trained. I've always done something. You know, I've always been an active kid. So, yeah, I mean, taking that out of my life, it, that sport has been a part of my life, obviously, longer than my kids have been a part of my life. You know what I mean? So it's, um, it's a massive, it's a massive, massive thing. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, Back in the gym now, I did have an elbow operation after the Lando fight. I fought Lando and I had a few niggles in my elbow. I thought I was okay, carried on training. Tried to train through it, but then I realised, you know, it wasn't it wasn't correct. So I went to get an MRI scan and I had to have a clean out basically. I had some bone floating around in there and I had extra bone growing into my joint. So I couldn't straight to my arm. So I had to go and get the bone shaved off and cleaned out. But it's been five weeks since operation now and um, I'm back on the mat, so I'm back on the mat for a week. They said six weeks, give it six weeks before I do start training, but I felt okay after four weeks, so I got back into training. But, I mean, I feel, I'm, a, I'm that kind of person where I feel that even though my elbow's injured, there's always 100% something else you can do. I can run, I can lift weights on my legs, I can do things around that. So I've, tra- I've stayed fit even though I've been in a sling, if you, if you like. Thanks for watching this episode. We really appreciate you supporting Homie and the Dude. Please hit us with the Holy Trinity, like our Facebook page, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and follow us on Instagram. Just search at Homie and the Dude. It all really helps. Yeah, it's, uh, we'll circle back to the Lando fight in a second, but I was just going to ask you that. So you mm-hmm. had sharper elbows. Yeah, <laughs> sharper elbows. Those elbows are razor blades now. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just thinking about you know that five or six weeks without being able to, to fully train in MMA across all the disciplines. But you mentioned you had other things that you're doing. We've heard from other fighters, you know, Tyson Fury comes to mind that he's in his happy place. He's in his mentally, you know, healthy place when he's training. Um, it's similar for you that, you know, when you had the, the surgery, were you trying to find something to keep you in that place where, you know, you're feeling mentally positive and, uh, it, you know, as it's been a big part of your life, how does, how does that work for you coming off of training? Yeah, I think I have to. I have to try and stay in routine, really. I mean, because it does, as an athlete, when you used to train in two to three times every day and then you go down to, like, a totally different type of training, maybe only training once a day, it's, um, you know, you, you do miss it and, you know, you need to keep keep your head on the straight and narrow, really, because, when, like I say, when it's been a part of your life so long, you know, you need to keep your mind occupied. I'll be honest, I'm a nightmare to be around when I'm not, when I'm not training. That's, you know, yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking. Um, yeah. And then you've heard it before so many times. Sorry? I said that's exactly what, I was, what came to mind for me. And you hear it, you hear it in other, uh, with other fighters as well, that you know, they, they go stir crazy if they're not training. Yeah, and, and I'm exactly the same. Like a week off from training for me is, is very hard for me to do. You know? like if I go away for a week, a week's enough. If I go on holiday and stuff with my family, I'm probably still training while I'm on holiday, I'll be honest. <laughs> It's not great for the family, and but it's it's just the part of our lives, and I think most fighters have been like, or more, most athletes have been like, I've always been like, even through my wrestling career, you know, after fights, I'll be straight back in the gym within a few days, or within a week at least. Mm. And do you know what? It, it, it's it's evident that, like you said, that you've been doing this for longer than your kids have been around. You know, you've been 
doing this for most of your life and it means so much to you and you know um it, it's evident that that passion is there you can really hear it when you talk about you know how much being in the gym really means to you mike um but you also just mentioned your your wrestling career and i wanted i definitely wanted to touch on that because it's pretty damn amazing you had a pretty awesome career and it's where you start out it's where you get most of your uh, most of your like core skills come from your wrestling and your grappling and stuff uh talk me through what like what about wrestling when you were young like really encapsulated you what drove you towards wrestling and then down that path uh in your younger younger years it was um i mean wrestling in the uk is not is not popular obviously so there's not mm. many people who do think oh I'll, just, I'll go wrestling you know it's more about football than in my time a lot about rugby mm. so wrestling is not popular at all it was just like one, one day, I suppose, we went into school and my uh, my friends were talking about going trying wrestling because they live right close to the wrestling. And I, I went home and I asked my dad and I said, can I go and try wrestling? And then that's when I found out my dad had done it when he was younger. I didn't know he'd actually ever done it. He never told me. He'd done it in a really old school gym. It was more like a shed, which was called the Snake Pit back then. So it was, it was a really old school. Nice. He did it in that. And that's when I found out my dad had done it. So... I went and I tried it out, you know. My first coach was uh, Roy Wood, who also, he owns the Snake Pit now. Mm. And he was an old school, very old school wrestler uh, from like Billy Riley and people like that. So those of you obviously follow Cats Wrestling now, he, he was a, he's a big thing in Cats Wrestling, Roy Wood. So I went and, and I wrestled and I was only a small little thing. I have, there's, from, from my family, there's like five, there's five brothers and sisters I've got. So, I suppose it was a natural at wrestling because I was one of the youngest and, you know, I got beat up with my brothers and sisters and you had to wrestle just to get your tea sometimes, you know what I mean? So <laughs> I was kind of used to wrestling and when I went down anyway and I, and I wrestled and the, the Roy Wood come to me after the, after the class and he says, you, you could be good, you're a natural, you know, and I was a very confident kid as a, when I was younger. So because he come and said that to me, it built my confidence up straight away just because he said you could be good and you did really well and stuff like that, just the right words, I suppose. And that's it. I was hooked then. You know, I went back and all my friends quit and they went into rugby because rugby was mass rugby's massive in Wigan, it's a rugby time. Mm. And I carried on wrestling. So, you know, and I, I actually growing up, I actually got got some stick for wrestling because you were the singlets, you know. Yeah. And <laughs> you're grabbing another man and you're trying to roll him to his back and all that type of stuff. So no one in the UK really understands wrestling, so they automatically, you know, give you a bit of stick for doing it. So I had to take a bit of that, but you know, it's um, I it was part and parcel of growing up. But yeah, and then that was six years old when I started my wrestling. Then I um, I ended up with a coach from from America, mm -hmm. and he probably excelled me to the next level kind of thing. So I had him from when I was ten up to thirteen, mm -hmm. and um, like I say, he excelled my wrestling a lot. And then he left to he left and went over back to America. So I kind of fell out with the wrestling a little bit then. And when I was 13, I quit wrestling for a year and I went to rugby. Tried out oh. rugby. Wow. And then, you know, I was all right at rugby, but I was a small kid, so I wasn't big enough to play rugby. What position were you playing in rugby? What position were you on the field? Uh, it was called, I was on the wing, really. Like the way of the big lads. Because <laughs> yeah. I was... <laughs> But I could get stuck that's in. That's your, that's your recollection. That, that was my that was my position as well. I, I'm, I'm a skinny dude who, who is out on the wing as well, so I, I know exactly. When your coach is like going down the line, like yeah, forward, 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 wing. <laughs> <laughs> they stick the small lads on the wing. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, then I um, I went back to I went back to wrestling, and then that was it. You know. I, I wrestled, I wrestled for a few years again, got took on the world-class program for freestyle wrestling. And I was I was best in the country for from being a kid right up and through to being a senior, really. And you know, and that's that's when I obviously started. I mean, as a kid, I, I thought when I got to like 10 to 12 year old, I was always thinking I want to go to the Olympics, I want to become World Games. And I always had that mindset where because wrestling wasn't big in this country, and I still have that mindset where I want to make wrestling big in this country. Now, mm. I want, first thing was always I wanted to do it as a wrestler. I wanted to be the best wrestler. I wanted to go to the Olympics and get a medal. I wanted to go to Commonwealth Games and get a medal and, and make it big, you know, make it popular in this country. And I suppose, you know, the goals never change because I can still do that with the UFC. I want to, I want to wrestle and beat, win mm. fighters in the UFC. And I want kids to say, I want to try wrestling now, you know. 
So yeah. the goals never change, but that, that was my goal as a kid, really. Do you know what? It's, it's beautiful to, again, like uh, just something that's really coming across, Mike, is just how much your love and passion for this is there. And, you know, it's something that, you know, I, I, I see a lot of fighters talk about, you know, some people are fighting for the money and eventually, you know, that kind of runs out of steam. Some people are fighting for the glory of championships. But it seems that when people have something that is a personal thing that they're fighting for, you know, for you, it's, it's making wrestling more popular, being a, an icon or, you know, a, a leader, a pioneer, you know, for young kids in the UK um, to find that. You know, it, it, it's really obvious and evident that you've got something really passionate deep within you that you're fighting for. And I think that's going to lead you to some really great places. Um, also, you, you mentioned that your dad was a wrestler. You're a wrestler now. Your son is uh, your son is getting into it. This generational thing, <laughs> is that something? How do you feel about that as someone who's been in the ring and taken damage, you know, endured like some hard fights and stuff? How do you feel about your son stepping into something that, uh, that, that you're, you're doing as well. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's inevitable. If you're a Grundy, you're going to wrestle at some point. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, my son has followed my footsteps. You know, he started wrestling when he was four years old. Um, you know, I obviously asked when he was six. But I think it's just, they not just really follow my footsteps, my, my son. It's just the fact that because... I've tried him with other things, like I've tried my son with rugby, I've tried him with football, I've tried him with other things, and he just, he just enjoyed, probably because he's been watching me since he was a baby, he was watching me do wrestling competitions and wrestle since he, he was sat on the side of the mat when he was, you know, since he was born, really, so he's been watching it since he was born, so he just took to it naturally, and, you know, as he grew up and he seen me get to the UFC and he's seen all these things, seen me fight and things like that, he said that's what he wants to do, so I've not forced him into it, but if, he, if that's what he wants to do, then he's going to have my full support. You know, yeah. I ain't going to and talk him out of it because mm. that's his goal, that's his dream, and, and he's good enough to do it. And I'm just going to guide him in the right direction and give him my full support. And, you know, that's what's good about me. You know, I've made a lot of mistakes in my career and I've, I've, made, a, I've, done a lot, I've made a lot of good decisions also. But the good thing is he's growing up now and he's learning from the mistakes, but he's also making the good decisions that I made too. So he's... He's going to be a lot better than I, I ever was and ever am. Amazing. Hey, that's awesome to hear. That's it's super a, awesome. And I, I actually think about, you know, because we're father and son as well. I was a professional yeah, basketball yeah. coach. And uh, yeah, and, um, and Bodhi played basketball growing up. And, and we always had, I was his coach for much of his youth, whether it was basketball, whether it was football. I mean, pretty much. You were, you were one of my corner men for karate when I was younger yeah. as well. But there's, there's a, it's tricky, isn't it, Mike? Because... You know, you, for for a couple reasons, but you definitely want your child to um, to have all of the knowledge that you have acquired, right? You want to you want to impart that to them. But the style that you use in passing it along to them is everything, right? If you're yeah. too hard, then they might push back. If you're too soft, it's not going to work. It's really hard to navigate that line. Tell me about how your experience has been with uh, with Jack. It is, it is very tough, you know, like to be a dad and to, to be a coach as well, because obviously I'm his coach and his mentor, really. But yeah, it's very hard. But I suppose I've had to take a lot of experience from my dad, because my dad was also a part of my coaching from being, from being a kid and stuff. So I took a lot of experience from him and how I felt growing up, why he was coaching me and mentoring me from home and things like that. I felt that not, you know, when we're training, we're training. I'm his coach, and that's that. He doesn't call me dad. He doesn't call me, you know. I'm his coach. But when we mm. go from work and training, we're at home. We don't even, we don't really. We, me and Jack, don't really speak too much about fighting. Or I don't mm. go to him and speak to him about fighting. He comes to me. He comes to me. I give him my knowledge at home. So I won't, and I won't push him to go to training. You know, if he, if he feels he's, you know, if he's got to have, he's going to have a day off. I, I let him have a day off within reason. Obviously, if he's that trying to take two, three days off, then I say, well, no, you've got to come to training now. You know, that's me coach kicking in. But yeah, I think yeah. the thing is, is not not to force them because I've got, obviously I coach in my own gym as well. I've got my own club here. And there's about five or six kids that's been brought up at the same age as Jack. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple of them kids probably got forced a little bit to go training. And then when they turn 16 and they have to think for themselves when they've left school and things like that, like Jack's just left school now, because the parents not have the case as much because they just left school, they have to fend, they kind of have to fend themselves. They're not yeah. coming to train as much. 
and they're thinking, well, I don't really need to put trade in there because my dad's not pushing me. Mm. So yeah. I've never done that with Jack. So now he, he, he's still migrating me to come into training because I've never forced him, never felt obliged to go training every single day. So yeah. because he's got to that age now where a couple of the other kids who got forced a little bit, they've kind of backed off a little bit, whereas Jack's still going and going strong, you know, and I think it's just due to me not pushing him too much as a youngster. Yeah. And, and one thing, just to clarify, your entire, it seems like your entire youth was mostly focused on wrestling and then went, you know, freestyle wrestling. Is Jack now getting a little bit more of a mixture at an earlier age? Mm, you know, son, like the younger generation, they're, they're now going to be standing on the shoulders of the older generation of MMA. And if you look at MMA 20 years ago, you can't even recognize, you know, it compared to what's, what's happening right now. So is, is Jack getting a, a, a bit of a mixture or are you mostly concentrating on wrestling? No, I mean, Jack's been, Jack wrestled from four years old, just, just playing and stuff, but uh, he actually started jiu-jitsu and Thai boxing um, from 10 year old. So he's done a lot of, he's done a, lot of, he's done a few jiu-jitsu tournaments, he's even done Thai boxing, boxing, you know, he's done, he's done everything from 10 year old. Mm. Uh, more now going into the fighting side of things than he is wrestling. He still mm -hmm. wrestles every day, but he, uh, mm. you know, he, he, he trains his jiu-jitsu and Thai boxing. When he was 10, 11, 12, uh, 12 year old, I think he got like the European gold in Jiu Jitsu. So he has got a mixture of everything now. He's just um, he just won the trials to go to the World Championships next year in the IMA for the MMA uh, World Championships. Wow. He's won that. Amazing. Well, con congratulations to him, man. That's that's freaking awesome, man. And you congratulations proud, to you man. as a coach. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say that as a coach and a father, you must be super stoked to, uh, to see that yeah, happen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very proud of him. He's doing well. I can I can fully imagine. And you know what? Something I want to ask you about. You know, uh, obviously with your game, you know, you come in very grappling heavy in your matches, and you know, you 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 have a you know a very clear like game plan and stuff like that um, for when you go into your your matches. Obviously, you know, Jack has been working on his striking for years and years and years now, and and it's something that he's done from a younger age. It's something you picked up later in life. Um, is there, you know, is, is there something about striking that you really find at like, um, almost like the nuances of it and things like that? Do you notice the difference between yourself and Jack in of that you started later and he started earlier? Is there like, do you find that technically he's more nuanced than you or anything like that? Is, is any of that showing through? Or do you think because of the years of experience at this point, it's too early to tell? No, Jack's striking is very, very nice. He's, um, he's got a great technique in his striking already. And I think that's just due to doing it from a young age. I think when you, you know, because obviously I've wrestled for such a long time, yeah. you know, trying to pick it up later on. I mean, yeah. I started my MMA career, I think it was 2010. Mm -hmm. So to pick striking up then when I've already done, obviously, X amount of wrestling, there's a few bad habits there, you know, your chin might be up a little bit, you might be a little low, a bit crouched. Mm -hmm. So there's a few things that, you know, go against the striking side of things. So for me to pick the striking up, it was a bit more, a bit tougher than what it has been for Jack, where Jack's been striking since he was 10 years old. And he's already done six years striking, seven years striking, and he's wrestled from four. So he's kind of blends it. He blends his um, MMA red already really good, you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah I think starting any, anything as a, as, as a kid is easier. Yeah, it is. Yeah, very much so, isn't it? Uh, and 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 again, we're going to be seeing those, you know, those younger ones come through. But let me just say, mate, your your striking is formidable, and we we've seen now, you know, several of your fights where, you know, the the striking is 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 in, at times leading the dance for you. And you know, we, we talked a little bit about, I think it was before we came online, about the um, the Narimani fight, and that was, you know, that was. It seemed like, you know, the announcers as well were thinking, well, let's just find out when Grundy's going to take Naramani to the ground. And it didn't, that just isn't how it needed to play out. You were fine on, on your feet. Your striking was crisp. And in the end, you finished him with really, really clean, crisp. It was a left hook that was nice. And um, so it feels like, well, I'll ask you, where do you think you're, so if your wrestling is, you know, sort of, your strength where is your striking now is it is it still increasing do you feel it's leveled off or do you how do you how do you work this out this this Percentage. recipe so to speak of striking and wrestling yeah i feel yeah i mean it's definitely it's definitely getting better you know coaches are, are great you know colin aaron he's the um, 
in my eyes, one of the best in the world as a coach. And he's got an mm. unbelievable mind for mixed martial arts, for any fighter in general. You know, sometimes he'll teach me some wrestling techniques, you know what I mean? So, and he's never wrestled in his life. It's just because he watches so much of, or he's been doing it since he was like 14 years old. So he mm. understands fighting and the concept of it all. He's a very intelligent guy. So, um, yeah, my, my strike is developing. I feel I just need to blend them together a little bit better. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Sometimes if I'm wrestling, I'm wrestling. Yeah. Um, striking, I'm striking. It's got to be. It's yeah. got to come together. Um, and I feel I've found the recipe for that now. You know, and I think I think we'll see it in my next fight. So you know, you see a little bit a bit of difference in my next fight. I think I I won't be coming out too wrestling heavy. But we'll, you know, we'll see what kind of opponent I get. Obviously, I'll have to judge you off what kind of opponent I get. But yeah, yeah, I think you'll see a difference in the, in the next fight. Do you know what? I think you're you really like you said you know you're you at one point you know it felt like you were doing one and then the other i think first of all for you to even admit that the the amount of fighters in the roster at the moment in the ufc that if you ask them a question about how they feel their their levels of martial arts are would answer you know i'm the greatest in the world all my levels are you know top top level you know for you to say that the level of humility um, is absolutely amazing. Uh, and impor- it's important as well. I, I was going to say. Under, you know, you have to assess yourself. Yeah, feedback uh, for yourself. Yeah, that's the only way you're going to improve. You know, you're, you're looking at different things to mm-hmm. to raise your game. And, you know, I, I wanted to say from someone who's watched your fights and enjoyed them, like, as from an outside, like, your striking is badass. Like, you're, like I said to you before we started, your laser right, right straight is unbelievable. You throw it straight down the pipe. You break through pretty much every guard that I've seen you throw it. And it just rocks, dudes. Absolutely just rocks them. You have a lot of power in your hands. And I think it's something that I definitely think, you know, you have the ability to, like you said, when when you do in, in, in this next fight with this new style you've developed to mix everything, I think, dude, you can rely on your hands from the outside from watching it. You definitely can. You've got this, you've got this dynamite in your hands and you've also... Though, you know, you like you said, you take maybe a more of a lower wrestling stance and stuff. Your fight IQ in of like when you need to shoot and stuff like that is so high level and so good that, like you said, it's just that one piece that I think from what it sounds like you found and you've slotted in. And don't get me wrong, I'm hyped to see you uh, you go at it in your next fight, man, and, and, and bring it. I think, like I said, I think there's going to be some good things in your wake because every day that you're training and getting better, um, your striking is getting closer to the, your wrestling acronyms and, you know, becomes even better. Something I really wanted to ask you, talking about the wrestling and, like, the striking, going from one to the other. You go from competing in the Commonwealth Games, getting a bronze medal, then going, you know, then you, you know, you've begun already doing some striking and stuff like that, but you then have, like, got into the UFC and things like that. I want to ask you one, how you just felt about like competing in the Commonwealth versus your UFC debut. Was there like a nerves difference? Was the atmosphere different? Was it like more pressure one or the other? Like where did those both stand? Because the Commonwealth Games for, especially for English people, you know, and, 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 and people yeah. within the Commonwealth is massive. So uh, how did those feel for you go at like comparing the two? Yeah, I mean, um, growing up as a kid, obviously, going to the Commonwealth Games and meddling the Commonwealth Games was just a dream, you know what I mean? It was like, not many people really did it from England. There's a few done it, but there's not many who's come from England and, and got a medal. So, yeah, that that was... I mean, I always felt wrestling, whether it was a domestic competition or an international competition, I always felt a lot more pressure than I do right now, mm-hmm. even fighting in the UFC. As weird as it sounds, I'm fighting on TV in front of millions or thousands. But wrestling, I always felt much more pressure because I've been the best in the UK for a long time. So that carried a lot of pressure on itself. I was always expected to win, especially domestically. I was always expected to win. So that carried a lot of pressure. But all that pressure that I carried through my wrestling has helped me out so much to go into the UFC. Now I don't really carry, I don't really, I don't let myself carry any pressure. I think I deal with the nerves and the, fact that I'm going out in front of millions better now than I would have ever done before because the wrestling just prepared me for this, for this, this, for the UFC and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, I think I, I put myself, put more pressure on myself and I got more nervous from when I wrestled than I do now for the UFC. I, I feel, mm. I feel very relaxed and I feel at home when I go and fight in the UFC. It's, it's really interesting, Mike, because I would have thought 
you know, that dynamic of people and all of that. But there's another element that you hadn't talked about that I'm interested in as well. So wrestling is is sort of presented to us as a sport, right? It's a, you know, it's a grappling competition. UFC is also a sport, but there's an element of it that it's a fight. And yeah. so, you know, when we when we look at it that way, when we separate the two, stepping into a situation where I'm getting into a fight may add additional emotion. Mm. Wondering if 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 the wrestling has has cured all of that as well, or is that fight dynamic add some some additional different, you know, I don't know, pressure on on the on the night? It doesn't it doesn't add any more pressure, but it just it, obviously, like your adrenaline kicks in more. Whereas wrestling, I didn't really get that adrenaline rush. Whereas yeah. when I get to when I go, go to fight, my adre- as soon as I hear the crowd or as soon as I walk out, you know the adrenaline kicks in and you know you you fully focused and your mind's different. Then I kind of I go in a very relaxed frame of mind when I go to fight. But the adrenaline's there. You know you can't feel much when you're fighting. No punches and stuff like that. You just feel everything after the fight. Whereas wrestling was different. I was fully aware of everything what was going on when I'm wrestling because the adrenaline didn't take over. Yeah. That's yeah. that's super interesting though. I, I, that's actually something that really, really interests me because you know, uh it, it makes sense like what you said, you know, the, the the fact that you're getting in a fight, you know, and the adrenaline would be coursing and whatnot. Um, I wonder how much, you know, that that adrenaline like boost that you get as you walk out for not not for you specifically, but for fighters in general. How much of that like affects their stamina then within the fight, you know, whether they get an adrenaline dump, you know, walking to the ring in like the nerves and then whether that crashes them then getting in the ring and whether they uh, whether they struggle. I could uh, imagine seeing that. It doesn't seem like that's the case for you. It seems like you're you're actually when you get in the ring more focused and more like ready to get at it than than even, you know, when you're in the changing rooms warming up and things like that. It seems like you get more in the zone from that. Yeah, I do. I mean, like I say, I am, I am, I do feel like I'm quite relaxed, you know, before I walk out and and when I get into the cage, I just feel comfortable there, really. And yeah, even when the crowd, you know, the crowd are, crowd are there, that's when your adrenaline kicks. And that, that was the difference between when I fought on Fight Island. When I fought on Fight Island, there was no crowd. And then obviously when I fought in Texas last against Lando and, and London, obviously against Nat, the, the crowd was there. Your adrenaline kicks in straight away, but... When I fought on Fight Island, I walked out and it was silent. You could hear like chairs moving, commentators talking, whatever. Uh, my adrenaline didn't kick in until I started fighting. So that was mm. the difference then. As soon as I touched gloves, you know, my adrenaline kicked in a bit then. Or when I was at the upper side of the cage, I was getting announced that it kicked in a bit. But when, as soon as you hear the crowd, usually that's it. You, you know, you're just game on kind of thing. Yeah, it's... In it- I was going to, you know, we've talked about this as well. It feels like the whole period of lockdown has benefited some fighters that thrive on live crowds and benefited other fighters that really appreciate just having a still place that they can, it almost feels like a training session for them. And, uh, and so you can hear their coaches, you can hear your coaches, you can hear, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more, you know, very similar to stuff that you've been doing weekly, monthly leading up to the fight. Would you say you're more of a, it sounds like you're more of a, a, a live crowd type fighter, but w- w- what's your take on that? Yeah, see, I thought, I thought, when I was, when I got announced to fight on Fire Island, I thought, oh yeah, this is great, you know, the, there's no crowd or whatever, there's just go and fight, you know, like you said, like a sparring session. And I did that one. And then I did Texas again. And I thought, you know what, I'd rather have the crowd. Whether they're booing me or they're not, whether they're cheering me or I don't know, I don't care. But definitely rather up the crowd, the fans there. Nice. Well, you, you mentioned you're waiting to see who the UFC puts uh, puts up for you to think about fighting. But the UFC has not done you any favors, mate. I mean, you came in. It felt like the first fight against uh, Naramani was was about right for a first fight. But immediately, you know, you look at guys like uh, Sean O'Malley or other guys where they bring in, they kind of smooth them in. You know, they kind of give them a few fights to get it. Dude, you, your next fight is a uh, Mavsar. Uh, Evloev, and then you fight Landau, who comes down from lightweight into featherweight. Neither one of those, I mean, both of those are legitimately. And Evloev, Evloev is 15 0 at this point. <laughs> yeah. So like, these, are, these are, you know, not, yeah, not to say, look, they're part of the UFC. I get baptism it. Baptism by fire. <laughs> but there is an element of, like, you know, of strategically building someone. And you've, have, you've had the fast track into the full, you know, the full impact of the highest level of the UFC. Yeah, there's definitely been no favours, you know, like I said, Nad, <laughs> Nad Naramani, too, he was 
two and zero in the FC, and he was Cage Warriors World Champion, just beat Paddy Pimler, you know. So he, he, he was a um, he was a prospect, you know. He was like I said, two fight winning streak in the FC is good, unbeaten five six fights. So yeah, that was that was always a tough fight on paper. And then yeah, Mosa and one world champion also had a world belt and you know unbeaten. And then um, yeah, Lando coming down obviously. You know, he had a deep good fight against Tony Ferguson. You know, nearly knocked him out when he was on a, on a big rise, coming down away. You know, yeah, I've not had no favors, but you know, I, I'm, all, I'm that kind of guy that will just fight anyone. I won't say no to any fight. And, you know, I look, yeah. I do look at my, I do look at my division and I see fighters, and I think, you know, what, I could, I could beat that guy definitely in the, in the first first two rounds. I could beat that guy. There's a lot of fights I look and I know I can beat comfortably. And I've just not had them guys yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, with regard to Lando, so he comes down from lightweight. How much of that did you feel? Um, so, you know, he cuts weight to get down to 45. You, he enters the ring, uh, into, into the cage. I'm not sure how much more weight he put on. Did, how much of that felt like a difference in that, in that fight? Because you had so many, you had more than, I don't know, there was nine, shots. There, there was nine takedowns in the first round. Yeah, and then nine from takedown the, attempts. Yeah, and then from then on, it was just, you, you were just all over his legs. Yeah. Like, it felt like it was maybe his power that was the difference. Was, his, was that his, the case? His natural strength. No, strength-wise, it wasn't, wasn't a problem. Um, mm. I mean, I'm, I'm not a small featherweight, you know, I'm going back mm. into the, the day after, like when we weigh just before we fight. I'm going back into the cage at 74, 75 kilogram. So mm. what is that in weight? What is that in pounds? A 74 is about 155, maybe. So maybe 10, yeah, 10, 12 pounds more. 165 it is. I'm going back in at 165. So I've got okay. 20 pounds gone over from my weight cut to, right. to the okay. So I'm not too small and strength wise, I, I feel strong. I've, I've, I've trained with light weights and I'm, I'm just as strong as up. So strength wise wasn't too bad. What the thing was with Lando was, he just never, he never really um, stood still. He never stayed on the center line for me to time my attack. He was always going backwards. He was always going backwards or side to side, do you know what I mean? So he was quite tricky in, the, in that sense. And uh, yeah. it was hard for me to time my leg at my attack. Yeah, and I, I have a question for you, mate, because we saw the Lando fight and we, we started thinking, you know, Mike's strength is is sort of like control, whether it's control on the feet where you're walking someone down, control yeah. by shooting, control by after you've shot and you're controlling them standing or taking them down. I'm not sure the judges, you know, when you look at striking versus either top control when you take someone down or shots, taking someone down off of a shot, yes, they get back up. But to me, that is significant. And it doesn't feel like you're getting the same amount of sort of judging for those types of things. So like we said, there was multiple takedowns in both the first and the second round against Lando. If you're a judge that values that, that has to be, you know, the first round was definitely your round. In the second round, I'm thinking that round is very like, uh, you know, if you look at the takedowns, that's potentially your round as well. How much of that are you considering this, this concept of, I'm not sure the UFC is judging my strength, the thing that I do best, as well as the thing that, you know, I've taken on later in my career. Yeah, so look, looking back, when I, when I come back home, you know, I, had a, I sulked for a week, obviously, because I lost, but I um, I watched the fight back. I watched it with commentary and without commentary, because I think the commentary can also sway people the other way. Mate, oh, that, can, I just, can I just jump in for a second? Oh, my God. We said God, the exact same dude, thing. That commentary was the one of that, the worst pieces of commentary we have ever heard, Mike. He, the, the judges were so biased. Well, the the announcer? Uh, sorry, judges. The announcer, sorry, were so biased during that. I can't even tell you. That was ridiculous. Yeah, we were right there with you with that. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I felt that obviously reading through some comments on posts that have been put up and stuff like that, a lot of people were just saying exactly what the, the announcer said. So it was just kind of, they basically just been, listened to what the announcer said and then just said the same thing. But I mean, if you put it on silent, I looked at the fight, and I even I I was I struggled splitting it apart. So there was no none of us got a thirty twenty seven. Did I mean none of us no. got a thirty twenty seven? No way. Thirty twenty seven, I think, and maybe they give him a thirty twenty seven, then a twenty nine twenty eight in. But um, none of none of us got that. It was a very close fight. But I think yeah, there's a bit more credit needs to be to given to the fact that the guy who's who's, who's the aggressor, whether he's wrestling, whether he's punching, whether he's kicking, 
you know, I was definitely the aggressor. Uh, I think I landed the bigger shots on the feet, you know, with the right hands. Yeah, and yeah, totally I agree. Pushed the pace of the fight. He went backwards a lot. And um, I, I think I pushed the pace of the fight. To say I won, I don't know. I'm not a judge, but it's, it's very, very, it's very, very close, you know, to, to watch yeah. that. I can think to say I won, I don't know. It's, it's very close. But like I said, I think that the credit needs to be deserved to the one who's who's pushing the pace. And, and I pushed the pace. Yeah. Whether I was and, failing or not, I still got his legs and I still half got him down and then he got up. It's just same as him, you know, connecting the, me blocking a shot punch. Yeah, he just I agree. Him. Still getting credit for it, you know. So, yeah, fully, fully agree with you, which is, you know, uh, as, as a small plug for us, this is why we do our MMA show that we do during the UFC fight nights, why we do commentary, because, you know, like you said, when, when, when you listen to that fight back, the, the amount of like, and, and again, I believe uh, the, you know, I'm not sure how close, you know, the, the commentators are to the judges or whether, you know, they're within earshot, obviously you're in a roaring crowd. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's got to be swaying like some people. Like, I know there's definitely, uh, definitely on Fight Island, there was cases of that shit happening. Yeah. You know, if fighters can hear, if fighters can hear the commentators, you know, and they're getting punched, you know, are in and around the ears and grappling, you know, then the judges who are sat, you know, with nothing, <laughs> with not another person rolling around them, you know, uh, there's definitely going to be able to hear it. So I think that's yeah. a really, really good point. And it's something that's, you know, a big problem with how it's being done and you know like you said the fact that cage you know cage control uh ground control actual like half takedowns full takedowns even if they get back up need to be scored a little bit differently what i did want to ask you based on like wrestling and now that you've been in there a couple times you know you've been doing mixed martial arts for a long time is there an ideal style of wrestling that really suits like mixed martial arts like is it the like the free wrestling style is it more like combat sambo um, is it more, you know, like Greco-Roman? Is there like a style that you think really is like the ideal style for MMA? Or do you think a blend of all of those is 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 a good kind of way forward? Yeah, I think obviously this day and age, like you said, more about the next generation coming through. You know, them kids are going to be phenomenal. You know, they're going to be another level to what the UFC is now. Uh, so and the, the, them kids are training everything. You have got to train everything. Uh, but yeah. as far as wrestling goes, I think... I mean, freestyle is obviously good because you, you're learning to defend takedowns from the legs and then attack mm. the legs and stuff like that. Whereas Greco, obviously, is just upper body. You know, yeah. being good, but with the tops off and it's a bit slippier, it's a bit harder to get them throws off. But um, obviously, Khabib's, you know, he's a sambo background, but he's also done a, it's, Khabib's also done a lot of wrestling in Dagestan. He wrestles with the wrestlers who I know from when I, I trained in Russia in the past. And yeah. he trains with a lot of wrestlers out there as well. So he's wrestling from a young age as well as doing sambo. But I think set combat sambo is closer to how many you can get, really, I suppose, with the gear. You know, they yeah. can punch, they can also take down, and they can they can do jiu-jitsu on the ground and stuff. So, well, yeah, I mean, folk style is also good, you know, in America. And they, they, they yeah. scramble yeah. a lot. You know, that that's that's important too. They can go on the back a little bit to roll to get to the feet and things like that. So whereas you can't do that in freestyle wrestling, a bad habit in freestyle yeah. wrestling is when you get to a if you get to a you go to your belly. Mm. So then you wouldn't do that in MMA because you're going to get backed up. So there's a couple of bad habits in freestyle. I think maybe folk style is, one, is a good one to do. Yeah, that's. Uh, would you say that's more like uh, Michael Chandler esque that folk style, and if that you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's coming from that kind of more scrambly kind of position. Yeah, do you know what? That's that's super interesting, and I imagine judo also plays like a big part in that. You know, the good, good tosses and and throws and stuff with with that as well. Um, but you know, I, I think like you said, this new age of you know fighters coming up is going to be something amazing to watch, though. At the moment, you know, we you mentioned the division that you're in. The division that you in that you're in is, in our opinion, the most stacked, the most yeah. deadly, the the murderers row of fighters. How, like looking at the guys ahead of you, I know you said there's some people that you feel like you can pick off. How does it feel to be in this division right now in this time, which is possibly the greatest time for featherweight mixed martial arts in history right now? Yeah, I mean, it's great. Obviously, if you, if you want to be a champion of a division, you want to be the champion of the best division, and that's that's my that's my opinion also. If I want to be champion, I want to be the champion of the best best division, what everyone thinks the best division in the UFC. And like you say, yeah, you know, featherweight and lightweight, 
probably the, the stronger Two. ones. I don't wrong everyone, but like you say, if you look at the featherweight division, if you look at the top 15, any one of them could probably be a champion, you know, um, yeah. on the day, on the night, you know, Volkanovski's smashing it at the moment, he's doing great, but I think anyone in the top 15 can be, could be champion, you know, but I look at them and, and I think I can beat these, I, can, I know I can beat these guys and the guys have lost too, they've not been crazy losses, you know, Malsar nearly finished in the first two minutes, but he's, he's on a big rise, he's in top 12 now, Orlando, you know, he's very close, could have gone either way, um, he's a tricky customer as well, you know, so, yeah, I'm, I know I'm up there, I just need to piece a couple of things together, bit better and, and, and I know I can beat these guys at the top, you know, looking at look at the top five and I, and I, I know I can beat them. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, we're right there with you. I got a question for you. I'm talking about how close those the last two fights were. How close was that Dars on Evloev in that first round? How much do you think about that fucker? <laughs> I still have nightmares over that, that joke. I still have nightmares. <laughs> yes, uh, it was very, very close. He, yeah. Just that he was literally on his last breath again. I, my, I was in my corner at the time, so I had the dash choke on, and he was gargling. He was gargling. He was, he was. I mean, even my coaches could hear him gargling, and then mm. just literally the last breath, and he, and he got out. And it was. Um, I, I honestly think ninety percent of the roster would have chat tapped to that. Yeah, yeah, He's, fully, fully you know, agree with you. you know, against Nick Lentz after it, he can hold the choke out. He can fight the hands. He, he can. He just seems to be able to hold it out, but. Yeah, he's flexible, he's bendy, and, and he got out. But yeah, it could have been a totally different night. That yeah, night. exactly. And do you know what? The Darces won, uh, especially in your earlier career, that you were just slapping on dudes left, right, and center. <laughs> um, is, is the Darce one of your favorite submissions? It's one that is a little bit, you know, it's a bit of a modified guillotine. It's a little bit different. You know, is it your favorite submission, would you say? Before you, before you um, answer that, uh, just from our perspective, the way you put it on is just so slick, Mike. It is. It's like you know, in the flow, you're. Just, it's almost like you're hunting it, and you. And when you grab it, it's. It's. You don't even like f as a viewer. We're like, is that? Is that? Oh yeah, it is. He just got it. You know, it's. It's so smooth the way you put it in. And even it's, even more like getting it and then cinching it up tighter. You know, locking that in even tighter and really cinching it up is one of my favorite things that you do as well. Is like making the small adjustment to lock it even tighter is really really beautiful yeah. to watch. Uh, but yeah, is it your favorite sub? It, it probably it probably is my favorite sub, but it's it's my first option. But I've got a chain of subs from that. It's just that I've never really um, had to go in that. If I've got that on, usually apart from Mossa, I'm finishing it. You know, nine times out of ten, I'm finishing that sub. And then if that starts not working, I switch to another sub. I've got a chain of subs there, which is my coach Colin, again, Colin Aaron. Like I say, he's got a Thai boxing background, but he's he's also coached me all my jiu jitsu. He's a black belt in Luta Libra, he's a black belt in. In, in gi jiu jitsu as well. And yeah. he understands that I'm a wrestler, I've got a tight squeeze and I, I like to get the neck. And he's put a chain of subs together for me and, and they, they work, you know, they work well. If, if that one's not working, I've got another three, four, five more that, that's going to come after that. And and they work, they all work well. Yeah, it's well, from our perspective, you're right, man. It was, it was a second. It was a second and that was a, either, a, you know, a tap or unconsciousness, but that's, that's the game. So with regard to, you know, your wrestling and you're with Team Kaoban, how much of, of the wrestling part of the squad is dependent on you and your knowledge and your experience? Yeah, how, how much are you giving, like, Till and Aspinall? Like, are you, are you dishing them a lot of the, the, the wrestling knowledge within the gym or is it, it coming from multiple areas? Yeah, so I will still coach. I still coach the wrestling even though I'm training myself. Mm. So we do have three times a week in the mornings for wrestling and then two at night. So there is, we, have, we do do a lot of wrestling. Our coach, like I said, although he's come from a, a striking background, he understands wrestling is so important for mixed martial arts. You know, if you want it on the feet, you need to defend it. If you want it on the ground, you need to take him down. So he, he understands, like I say, he's very intelligent. So, yeah, we do a lot of wrestling. In the end, I coach, I coach the wrestling to Tom, Till, and the rest of the pro professional team. So... Yeah, I've got a lot of lot of um, input on that that side of things. Well, and where so uh, as far as Kale Bond, because I mean, you guys are, are are known as as certainly in the UK, you're 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 the shining light, or or one of the very few shining lights in the UK, but globally you're recognised as well. What things are Kale Bond doing 
to continue, you know, every, every school is doing, trying to stay ahead of the game, moving forward. So you got, you know, city kickboxing in, in New Zealand. You've got Faris in Canada. They're all trying to be scientists, trying to figure out what the next advantage is in the game. How is that being approached at Keobon as well? I think a lot of it comes from the courts, really. And, and again, that's Colin. You know, he's, um, he's a very strict, very strict coach. And, you know, if he says you've got to be in and you've got to do 10 rounds of sparring and you've got to be in and do 10 rounds of sparring, it's not like a lot of other gyms, especially within the UK, there's, there's some that maybe it's just like, a bunch of friends will train together and you know they'll do two they'll do a couple of rounds and then finish kind of thing so it, it kind of the professionalism the and, and the, the fact that calling on perfection is i think a lot of it comes from that you know the, the way yeah. we train. and yeah the game's always developing so colin's always developing his brain and and researching mm. seeing what other people are doing and also make put his own aspect on it and i think that's important too you know you've got to stay up to date with everything like you said 20 years ago, the UFC was, you know, it was just a wrestler or you was just a boxer. It's totally different now. You know, you're, everyone is well-rounded and, you, you know, you've got to get onto them now. You've got to stay up to, up to date, really. And I think a lot of it is our work ethic as well. We have a crazy work ethic. We train hard uh, at the right times. You know, we, we do spar hard as well at the right times. So that's why, you know, breaking your jaw in a fight and carrying on is... Is something that you just got to do, and we've been in that. Not, not obviously not our jab rocking training, but we've been in them situations where it's been a tough round and you've been caught. Yeah. But you know, you crack on and you carry on. And I think the only reason I could carry on because when I was against Mossad, my jaw was broke, and um, was because of the uh, tough and gritty training that we do in T Carbon. So your jaw was broke versus Mossad. Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't know. I, didn't, I thought you knew that, but yeah, my jaw broke in the first first round. Oh, no. So we knew that, well, we had heard that you pulled a, ham, a hamstring in the fight versus Naramani. Is that is yeah. that also accurate? That was accurate, yes. Yeah. So in the first, in two weeks from fight, three weeks from fight against Nad, I tore my hamstring. That's why I boxed. I didn't mm. rest too much. Okay, yeah. It's worked okay. out better for me. And then um, when I was against Movsa, the, the first round, the first three minutes, I think it was when he caught me, my jaw broke down this side. I had to have an operation when I got back from Abu Dhabi. Basically, I had three places down this side. I had um, I had a broken jaw, jaw, and that was a changing point in the fight. When I come back after the first round, I couldn't I couldn't see where my corner was because my vision was affected as well. So basically, yeah. I had, if you watch the fight back, I stand in the middle of the cage, and the cut man comes and gets me with the ice and takes me to my corner because they didn't know where my corner was. So it affected my vision as wow. well. So that's that incredible, the, man. In the fight. Yeah, and, and it's also it's also representative. You know, there's other examples at KO Bond. You know, Till comes out uh, and was it his ACL that he had blown out a couple weeks or several weeks before uh, this last fight against Eric Brunson? I mean, there's there's a level of toughness that you guys have that I'm I guess mm. you know steel is sharpening steel in <laughs> in the training sessions before you even get into the cage that is super super important and and it's it's really reflective you guys are all savages yeah, till, till in the best in the best you know, in the best respect till, till <laughs> did, tore, uh, tore his ACL and it was like I think eight to ten weeks before the fight so we didn't wrestle and Burnley even sparred before that fight with Brunson and Till won't come out and say it because he'll feel that he's making excuses. But, mm. you know, I will and I can and I, I, I'm his wrestling coach and he didn't wrestle for that fight at all. He mm. started drilling technique a little bit a couple of weeks before. And a lot of people will say, you know, online that he shouldn't have took the fight. But you've got to remember how much pressure Till's under. The fact yeah. that they can't, that, that card was supposed to be in London and Till's main event. So they kind of based that card around Darren Till. You know, because yeah. he's the ticket seller, he's the guy everyone tunes in to watch in UK. He's the only guy that, that can really headline a card. So, you know, he had that pressure and he had the pressure, the fact that he pulled out a fight before because he's collarbone. Yeah. So yeah. he had all the things going through his head and he didn't want to pull out. As tough as Till is, you know, maybe he should have pulled out, but this is what goes through the fighter's mind, especially when he's high level as Till is main eventing and a lot of people tune in just to watch him. So he snapped his ACL and he said, I still want to do it. I'm just going to go for it. 
you know, yeah. that was a risk reward. You know, if he if he won the fight, then everyone would loved him, and you know, it yeah. would have been a, a crazy story. But he obviously lost the fight, and you know, you've got to give the guy the benefit of the doubt, and he's going to come back stronger. He's going to come yeah. back, and he's going to win, and I believe he's going to be the champion. Do you know what, as well, like, I'll, I'll, I'll say something with the utmost respect to Darren Till because I freaking love the guy and he's he's an amazing fighter. But I can imagine as well the personality that he portrays to the public in of that, you know, he talks a hefty amount of shit. Uh, you know, he, he he's he's a very vocal, you know, lad. He, he's, he's very funny and he's always giving people shtick and stuff. So I can imagine as well within that personality and within being that type of person that carries a bit of, weight and pressure to, yeah. to to succeed and perform as well because uh talking a big game often requires you to walk that big game as well and i think you know uh, that's something that definitely falls into that but like, like we said you know uk obon guys are, are savages and get through some of the most wild stuff you know you've got uh you you know with a broken jaw you've got <laughs> till with blown acls and you currently got Aspinall just rinsing his way through the the, the, yeah. the, the heavyweights right now. It's 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 beautiful to watch. You know, as people who live in the UK, who love you know England and uh, well, I, I'll say that generously. We 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 we're, we're we're okay with England, um, <laughs> but you know, it's really nice to see some guys coming out representing and bringing some fire and, you know, coming out with some great fights and regardless of wins and losses, putting on amazing performances for all of us to watch, you know, and I think that's something that Tom and I really respect and love about your guys' gym. We, we just love the, the people in there and the ability that you guys have to entertain and bring value to the organization, uh, not only just, you know, because I'm sure you've got fighters across multiple organizations, but, you know, specifically when we're talking about the UFC, you guys bring a lot uh, for the English fight community uh, to the UFC. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, I, I dude, it's, it's an we absolute try, pleasure. We try, we try to put on a show every time we fight, you know what I mean? Hey, you, you definitely do, and it, it's it's always been, been a pleasure to, uh, to watch it. One thing about that, you, you know, oftentimes the three of you are on a card mm -hmm. together, how is that, is, does it feel, especially like if you're the first person out uh, or the last person out, there's different amounts of, um, if you're the first person out, you want to set the, you set the tone for the team. If you're, you know, if you're the last person out, you want to finish the show, so to speak. And then I know this last time, um, uh, Aspinall wins and then Till comes out and he has this, you know, he's got a, a ruptured ACL, so he's got to deal with that in, uh, in the Brunson fight. But, what, what's the dynamic with you guys when you're when you're out there? Is, is there much of that, or do you feel like once you get there, it's it's more look, yeah. I'm into my own thing, I Individual need to individual thing yeah. as opposed to team. Yeah, I mean it's great going out as a team, yeah. But obviously, like like you said, when there's three uh, three of us or two of them in the car, the attention you know spreads out kind of thing from the coaches. So you've got to be all like, for example, when Tom was out, he was the co-main event, mm -hmm. um, all the attention had to be on him. And then you know there's not there's limited time to get Till out and get him ready and stuff. But there was always a coach back with him and. And help him out and stuff, but yeah, when there's two out, three out, it, it, it is still tough, you know. But the fight is great because we're all a team and we're working, you know, working together, we're all working towards the same goal and things like that. But when it gets to fight night, it can be a little tough uh, because yeah. the attention is spread very thin between the fighters. Yeah. Well, mate, we've we've talked a lot about the past. We've talked about you know you coming out of the last fight. You you you've mended up your elbow. You've just had surgery. You're back into training. Talk to us a little bit about how how what your perspective is going forward. When are you going to be into full you know sort of full routine of training? And then when are you looking to get into the cage again? Um, de you know, obviously dependent on when they call you. But what's your timeline going forward? Yeah, I mean, I'm back. Like I said, I'm back full training. I'm on once, once a day, two times a day now. Uh, next week I'll be on two to three times a day, depending on what I'm doing. So I'm back in full training next week, and you know I'd be, I'd be ready to go by the end of the year. You know, like I've seen there's a few shows like 18th of December. You know, yeah. probably I, I'd like to do around then if that's possible. Obviously, I'll speak to my coach more when I get back in more tra training more, but. I mean, they've just now said that you um, you can't get into the country without being double vaccinated. I'm not double vaccinated. I'm not vaccinated at all. Okay. I will do it after, but um, right now I'm not. Mm. So we'll yeah. have to see what happens. But I did see Dana say in a press conference today. He said he said we might have to go back to fight Ireland a little bit more for the international fighters. So obviously that'd be great as well. Yeah. yeah. Well. 
you know what, dude, it, it, it's something that um, it, it, it seems like it's, it's, it's an issue that, that are, the multiple fighters are, are, are facing at the moment. You know, you've got Michael Chandler, um, you know, putting out some stuff about that at the moment and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and saying stuff. So, yeah, well, I, I hope that that gets sorted and you get a chance to, to, to show up by the end of this year. It'd be great to see on a card. Um, you know, we've got, a, we've got a good few, you know, uh, English, English lads and, and ladettes um uh who, who are who have been fighting this year and you know uh hopefully going to fight before the end of the year um so it'd be great to see your name up uh, up in those cards as well and have you on those cards man yeah 100 I, I, like I say i want to be as active as i can I'm, the thing is with, with my career so far in the ufc before i got to the ufc i was i was very active it just seems like there's been a quite a few hiccups in the ufc for mm. me at the moment like i'm a fighter who's fit all year round my weight's good all year round I've just yeah. never, I've not been able to utilize it yet, you know, where I could get a fight and then, you know, a bit like a Kevin Holland, I don't mind doing a fight, a few weeks later doing another fight and then a few weeks later, I don't mind that, I would love to do that. It's just that because of the hiccups, I've not had a chance to do that yet. Hopefully, you know, this time I can, I can, I can get that going. 2022 is the year of Mike Grundy being the most active fighter in the UFC. <laughs> You're about to see Mike Grundy fight six times in a year. Back to yeah. the, he's going he's gonna to beat the Kevin Holland record and you're going to beat the Hamza Chemayev record by doing it two weeks in a, two, three weeks in a row. You're just going <laughs> to camp out at Fight Island, mate. I'm going to start breaking some records now. I think that's the way I'm going to be able to do it. Hey, we would love to see that. Um, it has been such a pleasure to get a chance yeah. to talk to you today and to... Uh, dissect a bit about your career and talk to possibly one of the most humble fighters we have spoken to. Thank you so, so much for giving us a chance. Um, I want to hand over to you to give you some space to shout out, you know, some sponsors, your your, your place. So uh, so what's going on with you? Man? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, as always, I want to thank my team, you know, my coach and Team Carbon, the, the, the best team in the world. And um, sponsors-wise, I've got one main one, which is Danny Casey, Qualitec. He's he, he, He's been supporting me since I was uh, 17 years old in my wrestling career. So when he, he did, no one had a clue where I was going to go, apart from myself. Uh, it's only me who believed in the dream, you know, and he supported me and believed in me himself. And um, when he had no comeback from it, you know, there's nothing really I could give him back, no promotion. Yeah. So he's the guy I've got to mention. He's been supporting me from day one. Um, you know, follow me on Instagram, Mike underscore Grunde, Twitter, MG Wrestling. And uh, I'm on Facebook as well. So, do you know, search me out and follow me. Amazing. Hey, Mike, it has been not only an honor, but a pleasure to talk to you. And we really look forward to seeing you get back in the cage. Um, furthermore, if we're up near uh, up near the gym, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pop our heads in and say hello uh, next time. Next time we're up in, up in the area, my dude. Yeah, nip in for a wrestling session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, so, so what? So you can throw me around for three hours? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you want it, dude, you might as well just get a dummy. You know, one of those like wrestling dummies. It's about the same amount of resistance that you're going to feel. <laughs> but it has been such a pleasure and uh, and we'll see you very soon. My man. Thank you so much. Thank By the way, guys, uh, this has been Homie and Dude, Father and Son, uh, TT RPG and MMA podcast. Um, please hit us up on Twitter. It's where we're most active. So follow us on there and you can converse with us, all that kind of good stuff. Um, otherwise, uh, subscribe to the YouTube where you can see all of our content and head over to Facebook where uh, our live streams get wild over there. So head <laughs> over to Facebook for those. Um, other than that, guys, thank you so much for watching. Mike, thank you for being with us today, man. Thank you for having me on, lads. Thank you. Such Thanks, Mike. Pleasure. Right. Hey, guys, thank you so much for watching homie and the dude today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit us with the holy trinity. Go follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and like the Facebook. It's the best way that you can help us out at the moment. Hope you have an awesome day. Thanks for watching, guys.